First of all, I would really want to thank our uh, speakers, Professor Dr. Alexander Braun and uh, Niklas Heusle from um, University of St. Gallen for joining us. Um, before introducing them, I also would want to thank all of you taking time on, on this beautiful Tuesday afternoon to join us, uh, join the lecture and the discussion at the end. Um, so, Professor Alexander Braun is a risk management professor at the University of St. Gallen. Um, he did his PhD in finance also at HSG and had scholar position at Wharton School and Fox School of Business in Temple University in the US. Um, besides that, he's vice director at the Institute of Insurance Economics and senior fellow at the Wharton Risk Center. Um, Professor Alexander Braun has a focus area in natural catastrophe risk, insurance linked securities, digital insurance and sustainable insurance. Overall, uh, he has more than 12 years experience in the sector of risk management and insurances. And Niklas Heusle, who is um, co lecturing today is a PhD candidate at the University of St. Gallen and project manager at the Institute of Insurance and Economics. Um, his interests are into, at the intersection of digitalization, insurance economics, and organization economics. Uh, he studied in, in Germany, in Ulm, and the both of us will be talking about decentralized autonomous risk transfer on the blockchain. I'm super looking forward to this topic. Uh, from my perspective, one of the hottest topics in 2020 and um, 2021, um, all around this DeFi uh, sector. And before I would hand over the word to our speakers, I'd like to point you to the paper they recently published, which is called Incentivation in Decentralized Autonomous Organizations, um, which you can also find on the meetup pages as further reading. I think that's it from my side. Um, I'm super looking forward to, to the input and the discussion. And thank you guys again for being here and um, to our lecturers for uh, sharing their expertise with us. Well, thank you very much, Malik, for the introduction. Um, and thanks for having us. Uh, we're happy to present uh, some of our recent work today. Um, let me try to share my screen and start the presentation. So I hope everyone can see this. Um, as Malik already mentioned, uh, the lecture will be on something we call decentralized risk transfer on the blockchain. And um, I think, you know, given the recent developments in the, in the cryptocurrency markets, uh, the sort of resurgence of the whole DeFi and blockchain topic, uh, this is a quite timely topic. We've been working on this uh, over the last one and a half uh, to two years. And uh, most of the um, content is based, uh, as Malik mentioned, on a recent paper uh, that we put out. Uh, it's currently a working paper on SSRN, uh, but it's also under revision um, at a journal. So uh, what we would like to do is, first of all, we would like to talk about the general concept of a decentralized, a decentralized autonomous organization, which most of you probably know uh, from Vitalik Buterin's uh, famous Ethereum white paper. Uh, we would then like to provide an economic perspective on uh, the DAO, um, just saying this is not a computer science lecture, it will be an economics lecture. Uh, because we think and we hope that we'll be able con to convince you that there are a lot of very interesting economic aspects uh, to these new institutional arrangements uh, that give rise to really interesting research questions. And then we would specifically would like to talk about the issue of incentivization of participants or workers in such DAOs, uh, which is an open question to date, and which is basically what our paper focuses on. And finally, we'd like to take this concept and apply it to 
risk transfer and insurance, as the title says, uh, we have an insurance background and we have also partnered with a startup from the blockchain or DeFi space, um, EtherRisk, who is um, all the colleagues there who are looking into using this type of technology to create a risk transfer possibility outside the classical reinsurance uh, and insurance markets. So that just as an overview. And uh, so let's start um, to get into it. So the, the basis of our um, thoughts on this whole thing obviously is blockchain or distributed ledger technology uh, more general. So as we all know, um, this is um, essentially a new form of uh, storing data in a decentralized fashion. Um, and we are looking specifically in this context at uh, what you would call a public blockchain uh, with all its temper-proof features. Um, more specifically, you could say something like the Ethereum blockchain, because what we also need is we need smart contract functionality. So it's not sufficient to have just something like the Bitcoin blockchain where you can transfer value from A to B. We also need to have smart contracts. Uh, which, as you know, are pieces of software code that let us execute uh, conditional transactions on the blockchain. That's very important. So we can code if then else um, conditions into transactions. And that's very important when it comes to insurance because insurance is something like a derivative, if you want. It's a contingent payment. Uh, you would pay a premium upfront and then conditional on the occurrence of a specific event, for example, uh, a loss occurring to the policyholder that insurance would make a payout. So if you would like to mirror something like that on the blockchain, uh, you, you definitely have to have smart contracts, um, let alone if you would uh, sort of mirror a whole organization on the blockchain in, in a DAO format, which we will look at in, in a minute. So we can automate transactions, but we can also have conditional transactions uh, with smart contracts. And it's, that's also a very important point. We can detach the transaction from human decisions, which is also important in insurance. Uh, Nicholas, in the second part of the presentation, will dig a little deeper on that, why that is important, uh, particularly in the context of emerging markets and microinsurance, where trust in insurance companies could be an issue, and that can be solved by, by smart So how does such a DAO look like in a, in a highly stylized format? Okay, we're not saying that this is the perfect uh, uh, picture of a DAO. It's a very simplified uh, thing, but we want to try to uh, convey the main points here, right? So uh, you still would have a customer, a person or a company interested in purchasing a product or a service, and they do so through a product or a, a service market. So they exchange uh, but, you know, they get the product and they would pay, as you can see here, in a normal currency or uh, on the blockchain, what you could use is um, a stable token, something that does not fluctuate, that really um, fulfills the payment function uh, here. So that's not really exciting. It's just uh, an economic exchange of price against product. Uh, and that product, here comes the interesting part, is in this context not being created or manufactured. Um, or completed um, by a traditional company, like a company with a balance sheet and a hierarchy and managers and uh, you know, employees. Uh, it's, it's manufactured by what you would call a nexus or a network of workers, which could be individuals uh, or could be smaller companies. But the essential part is they're being held together through the blockchain uh, and not through an organizational shell, if you want. There's no hierarchy, there's no balance sheet, uh, there's no such thing. So this is how um, Buterin um, envisioned it in his, in his Ethereum white paper, a company that is not a real company, it's just basically the organization being taken apart into its constituent functions. And uh, this is possible because as we know, uh, the blockchain, blockchain technology in general allows for peer-to-peer -peer transactions without intermediaries. And so we can coordinate and orchestrate the, 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 the actions and the functions of these workers uh, efficiently using blockchain technology. And hopefully through the orchestration here, this nexus of individual contracts will produce something that is pretty similar to what you could obtain from a traditional company with its hierarchy, its managers, its employees, and all this kind of stuff. 
So orchestration is now possible in a decentralized uh, fashion. And we have this additional uh, sort of part participation um, here th by, by so-called token holders. So that, that's, an, that's an important factor that we need to take into account because uh, this nexus of uh, workers will not come into fruition without an initial funding. So even a DAO needs to have some funding because these guys need to be paid in some shape or form. Uh, and this will require a specific token, a so-called um, native token for that, uh, for that project, uh, which could be issued through an ICO. Uh, or the token holders could acquire that token in a secondary market through a crypto exchange. Uh, and we'll, we'll get, I'll get back to why we need that token, because this token will fulfill two very important economic functions without which uh, such a DAO is just not feasible. So uh, this token is needed and the token holders are the, the institutions or the individuals that provide the funding through that token. Uh, and they can essentially also sell that token in, a, in an active secondary market as we see with many uh, crypto projects that are out there. So that's the general setting that we're in. Uh, and as we will see, uh, that the, the, these, these uh, DAOs will give rise to economic problems that are interesting uh, to research. First of all, a few more very important prerequisites. So what do we understand uh, under, um, an, I would call it an archetypical um, DAO. So uh, this is, if you want, the, the purest form of a DAO that you could imagine, right? So first of all, we have anonymity, which is why I said in the beginning, we're really looking at a public, uh, blockchain of the type of Ethereum, where you can essentially join and leave uh, at your own discretion. Okay? There is no permission needed to participate in that network. And we take that over to our concept of a DAO. So every one of those workers, let me just go back uh, a second. Every one of those workers can join and leave at own discretion. There is no gatekeeper there is uh, nothing to prevent them from participating or from exiting. And this will be important for the economic problems um, that we'll discuss. Uh, so here, um, per permissionless participation, I mentioned anonymity means you don't know who the workers are essentially, right? So um, you, have, you have no clue about their identity, their whereabouts, and technically that it's possible to find that out uh, in, in many blockchain situations, but it's very costly. So what we're talking about here are extremely high costs of verifying the, uh, you know, the identity of the workers. Essentially, these guys are anonymous. They're hiding between their um, hash address, between, um, behind their public key, uh, and you cannot easily verify who they are. Next thing is um, there is no central entity. You could also see that on the previous slide, there is no intermediary. We're really talking about this pure peer-to-peer -peer blockchain setup where uh, no traditional company sits in between uh, and, and, does, and, and like, does any coordination function uh, or screening or things like that. So no central entity. And also, since there is no central entity, that's also important, there is no entity that bears the risk of what we would call malfeasance, right? So just going back one step. So if one of those workers, let's say bluntly screws up and produces a, a faulty product or a faulty component or a faulty service, then there is no company with capital and balance sheet then, that can be held accountable. That, that's, a, that's an important point. There's nothing in between. You cannot simply turn to a company. If you purchase a product, let's say from, uh, you know, uh, from, from, from Daimler, from a car manufacturer and something's wrong with the car, you would turn to Daimler and you know, try to get um, them to be liable. This is not possible here. And it's really difficult as we'll see in a second to go after those individuals here. Last point is uh, that the, the whole thing is managed and orchestrated through smart contracts. Now, just briefly, why, why is it interesting to look at economics here? Also, um, there is an economic theory, theory that goes back to Williamson, um, the so-called transaction cost theory, for those of you from, with an economics background, very famous theory. And uh, Williamson basically already said back in the days, um, there are different organizational forms or different institutional arrangements 
uh, that uh, you know have advantages when it comes to the tackling of transaction costs in different economic environments. So what he said is that uh, you know there there's a simple market uh, exchange. Uh, market is a, the, the simplest form of a transaction. You go to the bakery in the morning, you buy your bread, and that's it. It's a one-off, very quick, short-term transaction. Uh, and the, the continuum goes all the way to transactions that are highly complex, that have to be orchestrated uh, in the sense of a value chain, a value creation inside an, uh, a company, an economic organization. And what he said is that, um, you know, depending on the asset specificity and uncertainty, uh, so depending on whether uh, there are certain skills or equipments you need to acquire uh, as, a, as a worker or a participant in a transaction, uh, and also depending on the uncertainty, particularly surrounding the behavior of your transaction partners who could act um, opportunistically, uh, these different organizational forms uh, will be prevailing or not, right? So what, what he essentially says is, if uncertainty is very high, so you could be ripped off, you don't trust your transaction partners and asset specificity, uh, specificity is also very high. You need a lot of uh, investments first before you can conduct the um, transaction. Then the economic exchange would take place in a company. And uh, that's what they call the hierarchy, right? In this case, the hierarchy leads to the lowest transaction costs. The other forms are higher. Uh, and the market would be efficient if you have very low asset specificity and very low uncertainty, like in the bakery in the morning when you purchase your bread. And now the interesting part is the DAO is somewhere in between, is what we would call a hybrid uh, organizational form. And through the invention of blockchain technology and all of its benefits, we are moving back from a hierarchy uh, more to this hybrid form where things that were previously done in a company now can be done without the company potentially going forward, spe specifically in DeFi environments, you know, where we have virtual products, finance, insurance, those are virtual products, not physical products. Uh, and this could be very interesting going forward. Now, as I mentioned, uh, just want to briefly touch on the economic problems that we see in DAOs. So first one is adverse selection. As I mentioned, workers can join and leave the, the DAO um, at will. And there is no entity that screens them, selects them, or prevents them from leaving or entering, right? So no HR department, no interviews, uh, you know, no, certificate, no certificates required. Nobody's going to ask you for your diploma or your master's degree that you did at, uh, you know, ETH Turk or um, Husky, uh, no such thing, right? So the problem is how does this company ensure, this not, it's not a company, how does this DAO ensure uh, that you know, it will obtain the good workers and not the bad workers. Usually the HR department is, is in, in charge of that decision, right? Is, is applying selection measures, is trying to look at signals like the diploma certificates, all this kind of stuff, not possible in a DAO. So how do you ensure that you get the good workers and not the bad ones? Adverse selection, huge problem, uh, not really tackled so far. Conflicts of interest. So. There may be different workers or participants or token holders that have completely different interests. How do you get those interests to align, right? So in a very simple form, let's say you are a blockchain developer and you participate in a project uh, that is also relying on miners. So obviously as a coder, you would be interested in having more and more computational power, but my, for miners, it depends, right? It depends on the compensation for providing uh, the, uh, the computational power and all this kind of stuff. So there may be a conflict of interest between party A and party B, both are part of the project, but they have diverging interests. So how do you create a common interest uh, for all those participants in the DAO or in the project? Moral hazard is a problem. So once you have onboarded the workers, which is not really complicated because they can just join, they can just log on, they open, you know, they download, the application and they can become part of the DAO in the simplest form just as a miner or just um, you know uh, providing some sort of simple service uh, as a worker or employee to that DAO. Uh, in some cases it may be more complex functions that they fulfill and they could have a moral hazard thing right so you you enter the DAO and once you're part of it your behavior could change right you could just say well I'm, I'm going to cash in some of the uh, transaction fees, but I'm not going to provide my service properly, or I'm just going to act carelessly, right? 
either you deliberately don't expense effort uh, or you just act carelessly. So moral, moral hazard could be a problem. We need to, and this is where um, our approach comes in, we need to incentivize participants in the DAO to make sure that they expense effort, you know, that they put in effort so that the result of the DAO is going to be of a high quality. If you don't do that, you may, you may get faulty products and services and the market quickly breaks down because customers will anticipate that this is, uh, in plain English, it's garbage what you're producing. And then there will be no market, right? A DAO cannot exist in the market for a longer period of time if it produces garbage. And it will produce garbage if it can't tackle the moral hazard problem with its worker. And the last one is enforceability of property rights, which is closely linked uh, to what I mentioned on the previous, on one of the previous slides with anonymity. Uh, workers can join and leave at will. They're anon anonymous and they are also globally dispersed, right? They can sit in Thailand, in Burkina Faso, in the UK, uh, in Canada, wherever. Uh, so if you would like to hold someone liable for malfeasance or for a faulty product, we know there is no entity, there's no company you can sue. So you would have to go after the individual workers. But how are you going to prove which one has done you know, the malfeasance, which one has produced the faulty outcome. So th there's a problem in actually finding that out. Is that even if you were able to identify the worker that produced the faulty outcome and you could prove it, which is hard by itself, you would have to go after someone who sits in Vietnam, right? And sue him there and try to get a compensation, which is you know, virtually impossible. So um, Enforceability of property rights is probably one of the biggest issues we have in this regard because you just can't get hold of these people. And if you think about it, that was the very purpose of blockchain in the first place, right? That was the whole idea was to basically find a system where transactions can be done without any central authority controlling uh, the network or being able to, you know, overrule someone. So this is this is the whole purpose, but it comes uh, you know, it, it comes as a negative side effect if you want to uh, conduct proper uh, transactions in a sense of decentralized value creation in a DAO. So to solve points two to four, uh, in this paper, what we're looking at is a possible incentivization mechanism uh, that you can impose on the network, uh, on the project, to make sure that these things do not happen or at least only happen with a very low probability. Um, what, what we need for that is a staking token, but essentially it's a native token for the network, right? Something you can buy in an ICO, which is why it serves two functions. Essentially, you, through the native token, through that, what we will use as a staking token, you provide early stage financing to the network or to the project. Uh, but the second function is more interesting from our perspective. That's the incentivization of workers or quality assurance. So. Uh, you could take these tokens and use them as an electronic form of deposit. Uh, and in case a worker um, conducts a malfeasance and that can be sort of verified in the, uh, in the blockchain network, then the smart contract um, that actually locked that deposit is not going to resubmit it or submit it back to the worker that deposited it, but it's going to send it to the customer that suffered a loss, right? So these deposits are stakes could be used to compensate customers uh, if there is a, a problem and someone should be held accountable. And so you take a deposit up front because ex post, after the transaction has been done and the client has a loss, you cannot get hold of those people who uh, basically were uh, liable for that. So you need to find a way to do that up front. Now, the question that we look at in the paper is, um, what is the optimal size of that deposit you should take, right? You could think of everything from the whole value of the product until, um, you know, beyond the other end of the continuum is virtually next to nothing, just a few cents. So where is this optimal level? Well, if the stake is picked too low, then uh, you don't incentivize workers properly. They will not put in the necessary effort or they will still act carelessly. Why? Because they just don't have enough skin in the game. So if, that, uh, if what you can lose in terms of a stake is too low, you don't care, right? It would still be optimal for you as a worker uh, to act carelessly because uh, you know, the cost you incur or the effort you expense to create the quality outcome may be higher. Uh, and so you just decide to save the costs, collect the transaction fee and write off the deposit because it's too low. But if it's too high, 
you know, then everyone would pro put in proper effort, but it gets a problem that people or institutions, companies that would like to participate need to be able to fund that, right? So if the stake is, let's say, 5 million just to enter such a network and then uh, conduct a transaction, you will basically exclude budget constrained workers, right? There might be very good experts, let's say in data science tasks or coding or whatever, uh, that are just ha don't happen to have like 5 million to stake in the beginning. So there's a, pro and there's a problem there too. The higher you put the stake, the higher the transaction cost, uh, the, the production cost of the product and the higher the cost of participating um, in terms of a, a capital requirement for the workers. So there is a trade-off that we need to look at. And the way we do that is, first of all, um, we create an, uh, an economic, uh, economic model for that, right? In this model, we look at the optimal effort level. And the model comes with a few assumptions attached to it, right? So we assume, for example, um, risk neutrality of the workers, but risk aversion of the consumers, which we think in a blockchain framework is not too far off because the workers could also be uh, machines. Right? They could be small companies or they could even be machines. Um, and a machine would be probably as close to risk neut neutral as you could imagine. So the goal of that machine would be profit maximization. Um, then based on this decision problem of the worker, you know, the worker would expense uh, the stake at the beginning and then get it back with some kind of success probability after the transaction, we can derive a supply function. So how many workers are going to participate? Uh, we can then look at the decision problem of the customer the person or the, um, the company that would like to buy the product. Uh, and then based on that, we can find a, a welfare ma maximizing equilibrium. Now that's all theoretical until then, but what we do at the end is we take a real life example from the DeFi space, uh, more specifically decentralized insurance, and we calibrate this. So we adjust the model to make uh, the decentralized risk transfer possible. And that's the part Nicholas is going to talk about um, in the second half of the presentation. I think you need to unmute yourself, Nicholas. Is it not possible? Uh, yeah, I think we need to make him co-host because only co-hosts are able to unmute themselves as a security precaution. Um, Shengnan, I think that should be, yes, perfect. Now, Nicholas, you should be able to do that. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, I promise I will only go a little bit over the theoretical model before I jump to the decentralized risk transfer. Um, we simply use the one period time model. Uh, this is for the payoff for one worker, where we have uh, this, uh, in the first uh, point in time, we post the stake, the effort is uh, used and we get like a compensation back. And in the second uh, point in time, uh, we get the stake back. Uh, depending uh, on some outcome, basically. And we also have a token exchange rate here with the uh, DT. And this is necessary because as Alex already mentioned, uh, we need to uh, get like this early funding. We need to have system specific tokens. We just can't use like um, other kind of tokens like Bitcoin or something. And we have to factor that in in our I think you're back on mute now. All right, okay. Uh, next, Alex. Okay, perfect. Uh, and then we can derive the optimal effort, which looks like uh, this, where we have like here the change in the token exchange rates, and we have like uh, the stake here. And what's really neat about the model here is the optimal effort is an endogenous choice. So uh, just for an example in the DRO, a server provider, for example, who provides like server capacity, we don't demand that their uptime is like 98%. No, we just uh, said like it's a stake and then they choose the effort, the optimal effort endogenously based on this decision. And uh, we also have a participation constraint, uh, which just makes sure that uh, workers actually participate in the network. Okay, 
And now we can uh, derive the supply and demand function. So the first part was like from an individual perspective from one node in this network Alex described. And now we can uh, look at the interaction in this whole uh, network of uh, workers basically. And this may look scary. It is probably uh, looking a little bit intimidating, but don't worry. Uh, we can decompose it really good. What it basically says here, the price can be decomposed into each of these nodes uh, by the sum. So uh, this is just the marginal value each worker adds to the product uh, equals the price. And we can further de decompose one node in this network uh, into three parts. The expected value change of tokens, which has to be compensated, the used effort, and this is the optimal effort uh, based on any stake uh, used. And we ha also have to compensate the workers for lost stake, conditional that the optimal effort is used. And we can also do the same for the demand function, uh, which looks like this. And together they form an equilibrium. And uh, notice, uh, can you go back? And uh, notice to, uh, where we have here the quantity and the stake in both there. So what we can do, uh, we want to maximize welfare in the system. How can we do that? We can maximize throughput as a proxy or the quantity, basically. This will be the sum of the consumer and producer surplus. And if we have like a, a stable equilibrium, this will also work out. So what we basically do to maximize welfare is we maximize the quantity by changing the stake amount. And we will show you later in the application some results to that um, when we look at the insurance case. Okay. So now, why do we uh, even want decentralized transfer of risk? And if you think about the classical insurance organizations, there are some problems. One of them is in transparency. And this is a, uh, it's basically, if you get an insurance contract, it's basically a black box what happens behind the curtain. And uh, this is uh, not good because people uh, usually like to know what's going on. And uh, if we have in transparency, we need trust in the insurance company as a prerequisite. Uh, if we don't have that, nobody will buy it. And um, this is especially a problem when we have an owner policyholder conflict. The insurance company usually uh, is there to maximize shareholder profits and uh, usually don't act in the best interest of the policyholder or may not act in the best interest of policyholders. And uh, in Western developed nations, this is not too much of a problem. It is a problem, but not too much because if the insurance company behaves too badly, um, there are contracts laws which they have to abide. There are insurance regulations which have to abide. So it's really closely regulated and we have a functioning law system. So if the insurance company doesn't fulfill the contract, you go to, uh, you take them to court and um, uh, you basically sue them and you get uh, your money back if you, if you should get your money, at least in most cases. Now, think about um, other countries, like uh, especially in the developed world, where this insurance regulation does not exist, where we don't have like a sophisticated law system uh, with a good contract law, with a lot of corruption. And this is exactly what happened in uh, India, for example, with the agricultural insurance company of India, which left their uh, farmers hanging for like years and only after years of fighting, they gave their payout and uh, decentralized trends of risk might solve these kind of problems. Next. So how will a decentralized insurance look like as an application of the idea or Alex presented earlier? So we still have our customers which price their product. We have a relayer, which is kind of like an insurance broker. We have a data provider who provides data for the insurance triggers or for the insurance uh, payouts. We have a data oracle which transforms the raw data into information. We have a risk pool keeper who manages the risk pool. And we have a license provider who uh, is responsible for the legal side of the uh, uh, endeavor. 
And we can basically add many, many more participants, but this is really a bare bone structure. Okay, next. So just to talk about a little bit about the tokens which we need in this kind of system. Uh, like Alex mentioned, we have the staking token, which is used for quality insurance and for bootstrapping the network. So a relayer uh, may not be, so that, that the relayer doesn't behave badly or that the data provider provides like real data and just not uh, provide no data at all, for example. And for the bootstrapping of the network that this network exists in the first place. We have the payment token for convenience, but uh, I will show you later in the in a practical in the real world. Uh, this can be any. This doesn't have to be a token. This can be also like uh, uh, in, in a, a cash or something. I will talk about this in a moment. And we have the risk token, and this is also a really neat feature. We can transfer the cap, uh, the risk. Uh, really easily to capital markets. This is especially important for like na na natu na natural catastrophe risk, like hurricanes, which are really cumulated uh, to like one specific location. So we need to spread out the risk much more and this can be easily done with risk tokens. Okay. And uh, I will talk about a little bit about the feasible products. Uh, not every insurance product can be made uh, in a decentralized organization. There are some products which are a better fit than others. One dimension which is really important is standardizations, uh, which just means because we have to code it into smart contracts or we have to write smart contracts, uh, the insurance product should be simple and it should be, can be automatic, automated really easily. And one kind uh, of insurance which works really well is parametric insurance. This just means we have a trigger uh, like wind speed. And if this uh, uh, trigger uh, or if the wind speed is above like 100 kilometers per hour, we get a payout in a specific region. And two other dimensions are like regulation and the contract length. Um, for example, health insurance is a really complex product with uh, durations of maybe a lifetime already, and which is really heavily regulated, which is also not uh, ideal. So what we, works really well is like a property and casualty insurance, usually over like a contract pe period of like one year or maybe a farming season. Um, and one of these examples is, for example, hurricane insurance. Uh, this works really well. Um, uh, here I present to you Hurricane Guard, which uh, is like for Puerto Rico, uh, Puerto Rico, where they uh, tried in test trial uh, a parametric hurricane insurance on uh, this decentralized uh, autonomous organization, and uh, it basically is a parametric hurricane insurance. Okay. And for this, we got already data and we calibrated our theoretical model. Uh, I've told you, uh, or I've told you a few minutes, uh, not a lot, but uh, I skimmed over a little bit. And here you can see some results for like different entities, for the relayer, for the claims management and for the data worker. And as you can see, the stake is pretty low, just like 30% in the range of that maybe. So we don't need an exorbitant high stake to incentivize the participants. Uh, a small stake is sufficient. But we can also see that uh, we have kind of this slope. So uh, it's, it's getting very steep at the beginning. So what this basically means, if you want to implement a decentralized uh, insurance organizations or something like that, and you are uncertain about the parameter choice, basically, you're not sure exactly how good your data is, basically, you want to go a little bit over it, maybe, so as the loss here is not too far, then to end up here at this area where we get quickly and steeply <laughs> market breakdown where uh, and loss of utility for customers and the network. Okay. And another example uh, I want to present just to you shortly is a drought insurance. This is a, a joint project between Etherisk, Oxfam, and uh, Aon. And they basically established a parametric crop insurance. Currently, it's just a trial um, in Sri Lanka. 
and it targets as, as a farmer community, small holders who are like underinsured, who are, may also not have a trust in like the insurance companies itself because uh, they may have bad experience like the people in India I've told you about. They might have other trust issues and uh, that's why they targeted uh, this market here. And they won a trial where basically Aon uh, took over the reinsurance kind of side. Uh, EtherRisk was responsible for the um, for, for the data basically, and for the main frame basically, and Oxum acted as a relayer because you can imagine uh, the farmers are not too keen in the blockchain world, so it would not work that they pay like in uh, in a Bitcoin token their premium and get their payout in uh, in uh, in Bitcoin. So that where Oxum stepped in, they added an additional layer of trust and acted basically as a as a relay about uh, and you can see these are just three participants now it's not a fully decentralized organization but this is just a trial and they uh, and it's uh, going maybe in the direction uh, we described earlier of a fully decentralized world we're not there yet but we may be in the future let's see uh, uh, if that holds okay and there are many more applications uh, not only like for decentralized Swiss transfer, we can uh, view all the applications in like the gig economy, for example, or in other areas um, in finance maybe. And this may also work out. Um, for now, we leave it with a decentralized Swiss transfer on the blockchain. And um, just some future, if you want to have like a short summary of our research of, of, of our project, you can look at YouTube, just Google decentralized insurance on the blockchain. There's a five minute explanation video. If you want to look at our paper, uh, you can find it in the meetup link. You can uh, just Google it, works everything fine. So thank you very much for listening to us. And uh, yeah, I, we are now open to questions. questions. I can see a lot of questions already in the chat. Um, should we just start and uh, Nicholas, we can take it, uh, you know, we can take iteration. So the first question I see at the bottom is, um, what do you think about B3i? So um, particularly the reinsurance part. So that, that's an interesting one, I can take that. Um, the, the project B3i is a totally different animal, okay, compared to what we're doing here. So B3i is basically a consortium of uh, reinsurers and insurance companies that are trying to establish a, an industry blockchain, a permission blockchain. Uh, I think the latest uh, information I had was it's going to be something on Corda. Um, and, it's, and this is completely at odds with the, the world we're in here. So in this case, we're really in the public blockchain world, world without any restrictions. Everyone can participate or join and leave and all this kind of stuff. So B3i is looking into a consortium blockchain between insurers and reinsurers so that their data exchange is going to be more efficient uh, but it really hasn't got anything to do with uh, you know the decomposition of a whole insurance company into its uh, components right so uh, if you want this stuff that we're looking at here is is, is much more revolutionary uh, the other one is just a, a more efficient way of exchanging data and i don't want to hurt the reinsurers we love we love them right but it's essentially that right they don't look to uh, decompose their own business model into its components. Okay, uh, so next, uh, sorry, what's that? Yeah. Nicholas so says, question, yeah, you uh, take the next one. Yeah, what's sure. That? So the next question is about like, um, how we get the information of the insured event on the blockchain. And um, this is a good question. Um, this is uh, why uh, hurricane insurance, for example, or crop insurance works really well because there are weather stations, uh, data from NASA or from third party providers, uh, which basically can provide this information. So this would be like the data oracle in, in the top level structure I've mentioned, uh, yeah. And um, then the next question is, who decides, that's actually a good one, <laughs> who decides if the workers um, act maliciously, right, um, or um, commit uh, faulty work, don't expend enough effort. Uh, and to be honest, we did uh, sort of try to dodge this a little bit or circumvent it in a sense that we're saying in the paper, 
uh, you could you could use a proof of uh, stake or delegated proof of stake uh, mechanism to establish something we would call an audit committee. So the blockchain project would elect members of an audit committee based on a POS mechanism, and that mechanism would make sure that the audit committee is uh, is different every time, right? So there would not be a long-term audit committee, but the members would be different, and they would be recruited from the um, network participants every time, and they would be looking into uh, what happened, uh, given all the information, all the transactions are stored on the blockchain, and they would make a decision, right? So. Uh, essentially, what we're saying there is that there needs to be some form of human control unless you find a way to code that, right? Which is not readily clear um, how you would code that in, into a smart contract. So that's what we're saying right now. But this is really an unsolved question and actually one that we are sort of trying to circumvent, circumvent a little bit because I think it's a different, it's a, it's a known paper that uh, we're looking to that problem. Nicholas, anything you want okay. to add? Uh, not to this one, for the next okay. question, maybe. I think there are more questions rolling in as we yeah, speak. Yeah, there are more <laughs> questions, so uh, let's see how we get, get <laughs> we got the flow, We got the flow going. <laughs> <laughs> okay, more complex insurance products um, where different parties are involved. Um, for now, we didn't ask this question because uh, the more complex you've get, you you get, uh, the more uh, sophisticated your system has to be and the more fine you tends to be. Uh, I think uh, for now, the target goal in this world are like uh, not cut risk, so uh, nat nat nature catastrophes like hurricane, wildfires maybe, in that kind of direction, or crop insurance for smallholders, which already take like a huge or is like a huge market share. Uh, also like uh, flight delay would be the easiest example. And Etherwisk did like a live version of it, which worked uh, very well, but it's obviously not a big market and the usefulness can be debated. But uh, crop insurance and hurricane insurance are like two huge markets which uh, work really well with it. And if these are like warning or something, if these work really well, uh, maybe then uh, you, you can look more into complex uh, insurance uh, contracts. Um, yeah, so maybe just an addition um, to, to that question with more complex insurance contracts, the problem is really the trigger, right? So as soon as you were able to um, establish a trigger on a loss basis, like in a traditional insurance, the trigger is loss based. So I go to my insurance company and I tell them how much it costs to re repair my car. Uh, as soon as it's possible to verify something that based on technology, let's say, your car runs a self-diagnostic. So you, you um, run your car into a wall and the car would run a diagnostic or at least there would be a drone or anything, maybe your smartphone. You take a picture of the damage and, and there is an AI that assesses the, uh, the, the correct damage and sends it to, to the smart contract. That could be something that could work in the future, but I think technologically we're, we still, uh, there's, a, there's still a way to go to get there. Right? So we're not there yet, but essentially, Standard, uh, standardized products based on parametric triggers are the first step into, you know, a, a, long, a, a long way to get that going. Um, there's a next question is, um, do you see benefits in standardization of oracles the way Chainlink is doing for insurance? Well, I, I would say, yeah, definitely yes, because what we're looking at here is, is, is essentially something that is in need of such oracles, right? Chainlink could uh, actually, let me try to just go back. And just one addition uh, to Could jump Chainlink. in here, right? Yeah, Nicholas, you want to go? Yeah, just in addition to Chainlink, they're actually working together with EtherRisk in Acre Africa, now in Kenya on a crop insurance project. So, um, yeah. yeah. Spot on, good question. So, um, that they, they, they would fill in here, right? Uh, and that's exactly what is needed to get this thing, uh, to get this thing going. Um, what else is there? Uh, how do you secure a good owner distribution without KYC? That's also a good question. You mean like the, the token holders, right? Can you actually select them or how do you prevent, uh, you know, KYC is typically then uh, AML, anti-money laundering is probably the concern that you had, that you would have with the token holders. Uh, you know, I think that that is nothing you would do inside the crypto world. So what, where you have to do that is where the FIAT, 
uh, the, the fiat currency comes into the crypto system. So whenever you exchange your Swiss francs, your dollars, your euros for uh, crypto tokens, that's where the KYC and AML has to take place. Uh, and we are looking at the situation when that money is already into uh, the is already on the blockchain is already held in crypto tokens. So we're not envisioning that for you to be able to buy such a native network token, um, there that be any um, KYC or AML uh, procedure, right? Um, that that's left to the exchanges uh, that basically screen you as an investor once you want to put your real money into the crypto space and uh, and this is what they do right since i mean back in 2016 2017 uh, the, the market was not as far as now but there, there are very few exchanges where you do not need to um you know uh, lay bare your source of money uh, give your um, identity and everything so that you can actually exchange your real money your fiat currency for for crypto Okay, there's one question about the, how do we certify the insurance claims? Alice, can you go to the decentralized insurance? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, of course. So the insurance claim, uh, we worked that out basically. And uh, this right. basically happens with the, uh, with the combination of the incentivization of the tokens and this top level structure here. So uh, the insurance claims are certified by the data provided by the data provider, or there might be multiple data providers, uh, like Alex showed you earlier with the general structure where we have the spider web of nodes, basically. It doesn't have to look like this. There can be multiple kind of things. We can have redundancy or something. And to validate the data provider, this is an issue uh, mentioned earlier, uh, where we have to need some sort of second order um, confirmation with like delegated proof of stake or something. In our research, we didn't look at that first because uh, first we need to solve like the first order uh, problems, which are like, how can we uh, make sure that everyone behaves well and yeah, how to certify the claims. Exactly. Just looking at the chat. Um, so we're sort of running out of time, which means we have to prioritize a little bit. There's a lot of stuff coming in now. Um, I'm just going to pick one. Could um, I... Alexander yes. and Niklas, you can take your time if uh, you don't have to run afterwards. Yes. So usually we can, we can take easily another 15 to 20 minutes um, if that suits your schedule. Yeah, that looks good. Sure. Let's do that. Okay. Um, so let's see. Um, exactly to chain, off-chain, and on-chain world. Sorry. Um, all the all the AO I know have a KYC problem at the moment to secure the distribution of the owners to avoid bad actors. Yeah. So I, I guess it's more more of a comment than a question uh, that is. Um, referring to what we just discussed um, a moment ago. Uh, and yeah, I guess the you know, problem needs to be solved, but I would say uh, it's something that you would like to solve at the intersection between the fiat world and, um, and the crypto world. And so the next question is uh, your thoughts on Nexus Mutual, right? Um, that is essentially something that works pretty similar to what we're doing here, but it's ensuring it's a little bit easier in a sense that you're staying within the crypto world, right? As long as you are insuring stuff in the digital world, it's easier as if you were insuring stuff outside the digital world uh, and you have to cross over, right? So Nexus Mutual is a cool model and it works, um, but uh, this ether risk idea takes it one step further and says, can we ensure real life events uh, such as natural disasters and things using, using the blockchain? Technology? Okay, so. the next question is about, uh, can I make a hurricane insurance for speed, a wind speed in Bahamas, even though I live in Berlin? And uh, yes, you can, because uh, <laughs> I mean, you could just also do without the DAO. Uh, you could just do a parametric insurance and set it up. So uh, I don't think that's too much of the problem. But if you're interested in doing specifically like hurricane maybe, um, I can give you the contact information or you can look at the Hurricane Guard website. Uh, the founder, Gonzalez, uh, was his name. Uh, he loves to talk about it. He talks about their problems, what they have with implementing such a, 
system in, uh, in Puerto Rico, what the issues are, how they proceed, and I'm sure you can uh, have an interesting talk with them about it. Maybe just a quick addition. So parametric insurance is, is pretty much a derivative. So you don't have to prove an insured loss to get a payout, right? It's enough. It's sufficient that the hurricane occurs and causes a wind speed that triggers the contract. So in this case, in Hurricane God's case, it's even just the category of the hurricane. So you could technically get a payout even without having suffered a loss, which means it's more a derivative and you could use it for speculation, which I think is the, the question is sort of alluding a little bit to. Um, which is more difficult in uh, the classical parametric insurance space because with all the paperwork and stuff, it's, it's, it's hard. But on the blockchain, I admit this would, this would be possible. But then the question is, do you really want to speculate on something like that? Because once you know that the hurricane is approaching, prices will be much higher. So uh, it, the market uh, would be very efficient there. Uh, and it, outside, let's say, the hurricane season, it's really a bad model of speculation because you would be paying insurance premiums for an event that is very, very rare, right? That um, you know could could lead to a payout for you uh, and uh, cash inflow, but it's it's a it's a low frequency, high severity event, so it's very rare. Okay, so the next question: um, comparing staking in DAOs with classical company structures in Switzerland, where would you place it? For example, public stock company cooperatives association that's a good question um it is it is similar it has similarities with public stock companies uh but it has no equity capital right so the token owners are essentially owning a, a, a share of the project but it's not a corporation so there's no balance sheet it's not an equity stake so the the the, the stuff we're talking about here are really not security tokens they're utility tokens so that's important to to emphasize, uh, the, the staking tokens we uh, envision are really tokens that, uh, you know, gain in value if the project itself as a whole becomes more valuable, but there are no voting rights attached to it. So, so that differentiates it from a listed company. We would also need, and this is something that's nice to have that slide here now, uh, what we haven't talked about because of uh, the time limits is, uh, you, you, to run insurance, you also need to have some risk capital sitting somewhere. And the, the entity that would use uh, that would collect that is the risk pool keeper. So there would be some risk capital from the outside coming in. And there's a second token Nicholas mentioned, which is the risk token. Uh, and that is essentially a security token. It's an insurance linked security token. So there, uh, this was more similar to uh, outside investors investing money in a company. The mutual or cooperative um, or association comparison in the question, I wouldn't necessarily see that. So essentially, it's it's more of a the breakdown of uh, let's say you start with a large company with a lot of functions, so a classical insurance company with underwriting, claims handling, all this kind of stuff, and then you take that company apart and you turn it into smaller companies that work together, right? So you could have a specialist company that do the claims handling, specialist for the underwriting and all this kind of stuff. And then you could take it one step further and say, those even don't have to be companies. All the individuals could be uh, just separate, but this is the extreme form, right? But this completely goes away from, from a company context. Um, it's more on a transactional basis. So I think there is not really a, a classical institutional arrangement that you could compare it to. Uh, maybe long-term networks, let's say alliances between companies, right? So where different companies come together in an analog context, not through a blockchain, but they have um, you know, corporation agreements and things like that. This is probably economically the closest, but it's much less efficient because it's you know, based on traditional legal contracts and not the blockchain um, and the digital world. Yeah, there's one question about that uh, or a comment that the advantage of parametrics is a claim cost, uh, which is close to zero in this uh, case. And yes, this is uh, true. This is one big advantage of it for the decentralized insurance world. Uh, one uh, big advantage is also that it can be coded really easily into smart contracts. So, yeah, but in, in, the, in the more general sense, yeah, that's their biggest advantage. The biggest disadvantage is something called basis risk. Uh, just a quick comment to that. Uh, this basically means if you 
uh, ensures wind speed for your hurricane, uh, it may happen that the trigger is not, uh, or uh, the wind speed is not triggered and you still lose your house because of the wind speed was barely, uh, was high enough to destroy your house, but not high enough to destroy, uh, to trigger the insurance contract, for example, because it's not loss based, you always have this kind of basis risk. Yeah. So I think there was a question in between. I remember you have a free tradable token in your model. Wouldn't that make the DAO vulnerable to flash loans and all other DeFi threats? That's true. So that's, uh, to be honest, it's a problem we haven't um, looked at in detail yet, but you could imagine that all sorts of things could happen, like a pump and dump scheme and all what, what you know, whatnot uh, could happen because the token really, as far as uh, we envisioned it, uh, I'm just trying to go back, it's a little laggy here. Uh, let's try. It does not really react properly. Let's see. That's the problem when you need to go back to one of the very first slides. Uh, this one here, right? This is what you were alluding to with the question that there's a free market and, 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 mar and this is exposed to market forces here. So if people line up to do a pump and dump scheme or uh, you know, flash loans, all these kind of things that could occur here, that could be a problem, right? Because if the, if the token value fluctuates wildly, um, that would probably not be optimal for the project. So um, one would have to think about, uh, you know, possibilities of tackling that, maybe having only a certain market maker that deals with the tokens, not a free floating on the exchange, things like that. Um, let me see. I thought I had something that I could show you on the other slide, but I don't think so. Yeah, so that's something, that's really something that um, I am. Uh, I can show you in the model. Hold on. So Nicholas skimmed over that quite quickly. And, uh, you know, I don't think it's really deductibly reasonable for us to, to take a deep dive in the model. But what the model contains, as you can see here, that's the expected value of the exchange rate between the, the fiat currency and the native token uh, of the network, uh, you know, as it changes between time t and time t plus one. So this is, we have a two point in time model. This is when the stake is being paid up front, and this is when it's being repaid, conditional uh, upon no malfeasance or no bad quality outcome. And from the perspective of the workers, this is stochastic, right? You don't know what the, the exchange rate in the future is going to be. So you're suffering from exchange rate risk because you pay the token up front, and then over time you have to wait. And then once you get the token back, because you did good, right? You, you fulfilled your job, you still have the risk that the exchange rate went south and you exchange that token at a, um, at a bad rate at the, you know, at the end of the, of the contract. So the only thing you can do as a worker is form an expectation of this exchange rate. And here comes a really uh, a key assumption, and I admit this might not be perfect, is these guys are risk averse, okay? They only care about the exchange rate. But if you have a token, as you correctly stated in the question, that goes you know, north and south all the time in very, very, very big swings, um, then, you know, let's say a risk averse worker would be concerned about that because the more volatile a token is, uh, the more it would be detrimental to you if you're a risk averse. We sort of circumvent that a little bit by saying they're risk neutral. They only care about the expected value of that exchange. But I admit there's something, uh, that's something that you would look, need to look into if it's a machine, that might be okay. But if it's a human worker, you know, I'd be massively concerned about the volatility of that exchange rate, uh, you know, because even if I do a good job, uh, things might go down and I, you know, exchanging back the token into fiat currency might have me end up with a, a lot lower value, right? So that's a very good question. Can you quickly okay. re repeat, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, I, I was the only one, but you lost me a little bit uh, whilst explaining. So what I understood is basically that um, as a machine, you wouldn't care if you staked your token, if the volatility of such uh, of this token um, would affect your staked yeah. amount. Can you, can you please explain yeah. that again in terms of the preferences so let's go away from the formula because i think that's just going to deter your um, attention so essentially the idea is 
if you are risk neutral, uh, you only care about the expected value of a random variable. But um, you know, if you are risk averse, what worries you as well is the volatility. So it would make a difference to you if you know a token with the same expected value would have a large volatility versus a small volatility. So you would find that more risky, right? If it jumps up and down more, volatility is just uh, the the bandwidth in which it you know statistically the standard deviation, but it's just the, the bandwidth in which the token price moves. And if that is a large band, then this would feel more uncomfortable to you because you know you know could be high, could be very low, not so good. If it's a very slow band, very narrow, you'd be fine, right? And this is a human thing, right? We Humans are worried about volatility. Machines would not necessarily be worried uh, as long as the expected value is right. All right, and understood. Also, yeah, Thank you very much. Uh, the uh, small firms, for example, they also care probably less about this. So if you have like a data provider uh, who acts like as a collector of weather data, for example, he will also care less than if it's actually an individual worker like uh, a self-employed worker, for example, yeah. Yeah, but what, what, it, you know, what it would change in terms of our modeling is, uh, I'm sorry, it's now stuck uh, here. So what it would change is this is the optimal effort for, from the side of the worker. And right now it's only influenced by the expected value or the expectation. So if we would have someone, a person that is risk averse, that person would not only have the expected value here, but some sort of standard deviation measure as well. That would be some volatility measure, uh, and which would make this expression more complex and which would actually, and this could be done in the model, right? So you could think of uh, a preference structure where this guy cares about volatility too. And then you would need to take care of that volatility problem, which is why that uh, the question is really good. So it really pointed out one of, uh, one of the major assumptions that, that we had. Yeah, I was thinking uh, about the staking time. I uh, recently tried out mStable and their governance mechanism. And what was interesting there is basically that the longer this, you, you stake a certain amount, um, the more vote, voting power you, you get. You don't have such a thing in, in your model that basically um, you stake only w one increment in, in yeah. time, right? Exactly. So, and, and we're not saying how long this uh, T to T plus one is. That's essentially what we're saying. This is the time it takes to manufacture the product. So, uh, if, uh, so if it's insurance, uh, probably would be a year. Um, because, you, would, you know, at the end of the year, you would renew the contract. Or you could cut the insurance in shorter increments and say, you know, if it's more comfortable for workers to roll over and for consumers, then you would renew the insurance at the end of each month. So the tokens would be unlocked. This is an, essentially, this is an interesting question because there could be a time preference as well. So there could be a preference on the worker side, how long they would like their tokens to be locked up, right? So as a worker, you have a preference to get the token back quickly. Uh, so essentially there probably would be an optimum between uh, the insurance coverage duration for the customer but at the same time, during that time, the token will be up, uh, locked up for the worker, and uh, this, this is probably an additional. Uh, this is an additional layer of complexity that either you could integrate in this model or you try to have to look at uh, separately. But it's a good point. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think uh, why they also differ in the thing you mentioned is because they use the staking for a different thing. Like for us, it's uh, a lot about this incentivization. Uh, but uh, you sure, uh, sure this time preference is like a really good point. And also with like the risk aversion, uh, we just made like a base model where you can add all this stuff to it. And uh, yeah, this I, is just a robot model. To create. Just let's say as a sneak preview, we're just working on a, on a project where we look at the interaction of time and risk preferences of participants in online markets, not, ex not explicitly in a blockchain context, but the results are uh, basically, they carry over to a blockchain contract uh, context, and so we look at how this the preference of a person to have the stake back earlier um, interacts with you know the, uh, the 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 necessity here. To we do it in a slightly different economic context. It's not about incentivization for effort. Uh, it's more in a, a selection thing, uh, but there are approaches with which you can look at such a, a such a problem. So. Uh, 
paper is going to come out hopefully later this year. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to, to this one. This sounds super interesting. Maybe quickly, and I don't know if there is still a few questions left that we can address. Left. Uh, yeah, uh, Kadira already shared the link. So if people have to leave, please uh, take this one minute, uh, click the link, give us feedback and uh, tell us how to improve or who to invite uh, in the future lecture series. And uh, Niklas, you can take the, the, the next one that you found in, in this pile of, um, <laughs> of questions. I hope it's There's a good one. sign that we have so many questions, by the way. So yeah. it can be a good or a bad sign, I don't know. <laughs> I think that's a good sign because it shows that people are interested in the research and are uh, engaging with us in a conversation, which is like, and the questions are really good, I, I must say. Yeah, yeah, they are good, that's true. Okay, there's one, uh, what's the next trigger type that will be used and why? And the trigger type depends uh, mostly like on uh, two things, the market forces, like where is demand for such kind of insurance uh, and what minimizes the basis risk basically for the people. Uh, so if you imagine like a farmer in Kenya uh, who, recent, uh, who gets uh, like a lot of drought with, uh, or flooding, which destroys their crop, uh, they are not too much worried about wind speed. So uh, it just it depends on the application and you just have to find like triggers which uh, where you can get like data providers on board, where you can find data to it, uh, like NASA data um, from, uh, from satellite images, for example, or weather, weather stations or drone images. There are plenty of ways which you can implement it. But um, yeah, the trigger type are like these two dimensions. You want to have like getting this data uh, in what way, whatever, and you need to have like the demand for it, which minimizes the spaces risk so that uh, people don't run into the case where they pay the insurance premium and don't get the payout because the trigger is not triggered. Yeah, maybe just as a quick addition. Um, so trigger is important and interesting, but the perils are interesting as well. And they sort of um, tie in with the trigger. So we, we talked about hurricane risk, but uh, you could also do this for flood risk, for drought risk, for all types of natural hazards, which you can measure objectively. And uh, Nicholas's point is, I think, really important. Going forward, we will have the option to use satellite imagery uh, to, to, to actually Im impose a trigger. Uh, the question is, what happens if you have a cloudy sky? So you need to find a solution around that, you know, um, with um, uh, infrared or whatever. Uh, but this is already in the making. So, uh, so I think people are working a lot on these technologies. And I think what will be possible in terms of insurance in the future is really exciting. It's really interesting uh, and ties in with these, you know, with these possibilities that the blockchain uh, delivers uh, to us. So the next question is... Um, Sorry, uh, Nicholas, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, uh, just this one. Um, yeah. uh, uh, if, the pay, if the insurance has to pay with uh, respect to token or use dollars, and uh, we don't specify that, and we don't have to, because we have the flexibility to choose what's ever best for the system or the customer. Uh, we can add, like, the relayer may make it themselves, uh, or they may we have another node which converts like the token into your dollars. And in the reality currently, which are used like in, in the trials, uh, we, we have two different forms, which is either cash, which is used in the Sri Lankan example, where Oxfam gives the people the cash money uh, to, to, get their, to get new seats basically. Um, in Kenya, they use another smart way uh, they collaborated with like a smartphone provider and they are much uh, unbanked. So they don't have like a bank account, but they have uh, phones basically. So they pay the premium with uh, an SMS and get their money in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, on the phone basically. So this is basically their shadow currency, what they're using. And uh, it just depends on the market, what the people are using, what they want uh, for flight delay. I think it was uh, US dollars too in that example, but it just depends on the market. Yeah. yeah. So next next question is about IoT. Uh, that's also a good one. Uh, does the connection of IoT and smart contracts for insurance make a 
good chance for new threat layers. Um, so the way this works with IoT is that um, you have an ideal data provider um, in a physical world with, let's say, a smart device, a smart IoT device that can send data and then measures data in the real world and then sends it directly into the digital world um, through the data oracle into the smart contract. So a very simple example, and I think it's already running. Um, I have to recall, there's a company in Zug actually. Um, they are um, experimenting with transport insurance. So what you could think of is you have um, fragile goods or um, you know basically goods that can um, basically get useless um, when the temperature in a trailer, for example, during the transportation period uh, gets too high. Let's, uh, let's say, you know, medicine or food, like, you know, living stuff that, um, uh, that spoils, right? If, uh, if something, if the temperature goes too high. So you could install an IoT um, device um, that measures the temperature. And as soon as a critical level is exceeded, it automatically sends um, you know, the temperature to the smart contract and you have the payment on uh, your account before the goods are even delivered, right? Because the, the, the IoT device sort of registers and knows that this, the freight is done, right? You can't use it anymore. So by the time it gets to you, you already have the compensation payment on your account. Uh, so IoT... I think AI and IoT are powerful additional technologies that, that stack with this stuff. So you should actually, um, you know, and this is what people are looking at, obviously, you, you combine those, right? So um, in terms of data provider um, for the trigger, for a parametric trigger. Hey, thank uh, you very much. The uh, light's already switching off here. <laughs> <laughs> Just <laughs> Yeah, I thought that that would be a, a good a good point to to uh, start wrapping it up. Um, uh, maybe adding to to the last. Uh, oh, modem, modem, that's good. You you posted that, Malik, right? Modem. <laughs> yes, yeah, like good. that's I, the one I meant. That's the one. Yeah. I have a good experience with it. I mean, I started it. So, um, what wow. I can add, what I can add to that is that um, IoT actually uh, does add an, a new layer of complexity as you said before with like the nexus mutual example basically keeping something all digital is easier than to try to to connect it with the real world um using data oracles as as, as you described and sort of yeah adding even iot devices to that makes it even more complex mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. at that point um yeah i think yeah. Uh, I would like to wrap it up, and if our uh, speakers still have time, they can uh, uh, keep uh, or stay in the in the Zoom for a little a little longer. Um, at that point, I, I'd really like to th thank the, the both of you for for the input, for the time that you um, uh, gave us, and all the insights. It was super interesting and, and a lot of a lot of fun. I'd also like to to thank um, all the organizers of uh, this lecture series. That would be uh, Trust Square, the University Zurich, um, the Blockchain Center namely, and, and the Zentrum. Uh, it's super nice that we can make uh, this, um, yeah, this kind of format happen and, and, and invite such uh, interesting speakers and have, have a, a nice conversation um, with all attendees. Now we have some uh, program uh, planned this this uh, the next the next few months. Um, I'm sharing the screen with you so you can mark down these uh, uh, um, these uh, dates in your calendar. Uh, next one will be roughly in a month on the 20th of April. Uh, we have. Dr. Andrea Baroncelli from City University of London. Uh, then we have uh, from ETH Zurich uh, from Peking University, um, uh, Dr. Dennis Yaromil Royo, who is a, a, a famous speaker. And we're still coordinating with um, Professor Rolf Weber uh, to, to give us a lecture and, and explain the changes in the in the distributed um, technology, a uh, distributed ledger technology law. So that's a little preview of what is coming, um, and just keep an eye out on on the 
uh, newsletters and um, social media accounts of the organi organizers will be sharing more information soon. So I stopped that. Um, then just one more, once more the, the, the uh, um, hint to please fill out the form before you leave so we can improve. And then I would say that was it from my side on from our side. Again, a big thank you to all of you that uh, made it tonight. And um, once again, to our speakers for this great input. <laughs>